All right, here we go. Today we have Joe Barone, former mafia associate and one of the longest serving FBI informants in mafia history. Hey, Welcome Vlad. to Vlad TV. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. Well, it's your first time here. I want to start in the very beginning. Okay. So you're what you call a legacy wise guy. <laughs> I guess if you, if you want to say it that way. That's pretty good though. I never heard that one. Well, right. Because your father was a soldier and a hitman for the Genovese. He was. Yes. Okay. So I was supposed to be with that family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So growing up, did you have any idea what your dad did for a living? No. Um, I mean, he used to get, uh, I have pictures of him. He used to say he was going to work at nighttime, uh, but I didn't know he was hijacking trucks back then. Hmm. Uh, when I was a little kid, he used to be a, a, what they call a beautician, a hairdresser, hairstylist now, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. him today. And I used to go there as a little kid and, you know, sweep the hair off the thing. I was like maybe three years old, four years old. Uh, but it was when he started, uh, I have a picture of him at the table, the kitchen table, him doing, I guess they did numbers or they loaned money and him and my uncle, they would have, uh, he'd go over the books or the, or the sheets of paper back then. Then it was only till he got, I, it was about when he was, uh, older, uh, maybe I was about uh, 11, then I kind of knew what was going on because he had a, a deli called Pippi's Deli. Pippi's was uh, was Rudy Pippolo, who was a, a, a full-fledged man. I think he was the Lucchese family. Mm -hmm. Him, his brother Tommy, who both of them are deceased now. And then that's when I met a lot of wise guys in there and I used to serve, serve them coffee and stuff like that. So then you can kind of see the guys like that. And also when I was a little kid, even maybe younger than that, he would take me to the pool halls and the clubs where they gamble and stuff like that. And they, I'd walk in and they say, hey, hey, Joey, who's that over there? Your bodyguard and stuff like that. And then you, they give you sandwiches. They show you how to shoe pool. You know, it was just like a kind of a, it was different back then. Very different. Now your dad was actually involved in the French Connection. Yeah, at the tail end of the French connection. Yes, that was a big heroin. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, Rudy got a pinch by that. He, my father, also took a pinch from that. Uh, and his best friend Tommy Murray back in those days was the guy who ratted on my father. My grandfather didn't like him. Warned. I don't know. They, everybody always says something after, but I think I could trust my grandfather on this one. He said, "I told your father never trust this guy," but you know how that goes. Well, the French Connection was a pretty big deal. Yes. Uh, they basically smuggled heroin from into China through Turkey or France mm -hmm. and then into the U.S. and Canada. But it was actually responsible for the vast majority of the heroin mm -hmm. that got into the U.S. So most of the heroin in America came through an operation your dad was involved in. They found my father had the Lincoln Mark III back then, and the, the trunk was full of heroin. Hmm. And he wound up only getting, because I think Tommy didn't get a chance to testify against him, for some odd reason, I don't know if it's because they found found him dead or whatever the case may be. I don't remember exactly, uh, but he only wound up getting five years. Now, back in those days, five years in the feds was uh, you only had to do sixty five percent of your time. Mm. Uh, so my father got out after three and a half years, but now they got you up to like eighty five percent. Well, right, because he wasn't a made man. No, because of the drugs, initially. Initially, yes. yes. Listen, my, back then, my father was what you would call a knock-around guy. Uh, so he would do whatever it took to make a buck. Uh, he got tired of cutting pe women's hairs and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, he started loaning money himself, started, you know, doing his own thing, taking numbers on the side, uh, you know, with a little help from people that were connected. But uh, that definitely was uh, something that they didn't want to. As a matter of fact, when he got proposed, uh, the, the the guy who proposed him said, look, I know what you did in the past, but now you're here with us and that's done now and that's it. And then my father never touched drugs again. Right, because he became a made man in his 50s. Yeah, actually pretty late in life. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and that's with the Genovese. That's right. Okay. And your mom had ties with Al Capone? She did. Um, it wasn't exactly her herself. It was my grandma, her, her mom's uh, sister's... Uh, brother-in-law was connected directly to Al Capone. As a matter of fact, he was killed by men from his that, that crew out there in Chicago because they were based, uh, it was different. They were in Pennsylvania. And so he had a long reach, Al Capone, back in those days. And they actually killed him for whatever reason it was. Uh, but then three guys later on came to my uh, his his brother, which is my grandmother's sister's husband. He was just a barber, regular guy, didn't speak much English. And the next thing you know, he got scared 
And they said, we're going to be here at the end of the week. We want the money. He didn't know anything about it. Well, he got scared, and as they did, and they packed up the whole family and get ready to go. And they went to the barber shop, and my uncle, I called him my uncle back then. He says, I got it over here. And he went back, got the shotgun, and shot them. And then he ran to, from Pennsylvania to Mamaronic. <laughs> and then from Mamaronic, they went to New Rochelle, where I was born. And then he opened up another barber shop there. And 20 years later, somebody came and shot him. <laughs> uh, didn't kill him, obviously, but... This is <laughs> this was the reach they used to have back in those days. Okay, now your dad had a Shylock business. Yes, and was doing sports betting. He did a little sports as well. Yes, and he actually taught you how to loan shark. Yes, was that your introduction into crime? Yeah, uh, I guess you could say that because uh, first of all, my introduction would have been I would have did anything for my father. So if he needed my backup, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I would always back my father up. I loved him. But when he, he said to me, I had $1,000, and he says, look, Joe, he says, uh, he, woke, he actually called me Joseph. He says, uh, what are you doing with that money? You know, I, I wanted to buy a car. I was like, I think maybe 18, maybe, 17, 18, like that. And he says, I'll, I'll make that money make money. I said, okay, how? Then he showed me. And, well, then I was making good money, and I said, oh, I like it. <laughs> and, um, you know. That's how I got it. Kind of got started getting customers, you know, stuff like that. Okay, so loan sharking is essentially a loan at an incredibly high interest rate. Not always, Vlad. Not always. Yeah, though, it all depends on who you know. Say you and I were friends, you know, okay. and I'm just meeting you now, but I'm just meeting you now, so I'd probably charge you maybe five, six points, which is still pretty high. Five, six points per what? Well, say I gave you a thousand dollars and you were just going to pay me interest. Five points would be fifty dollars a week. You got to give me until you got the thousand dollars to pay me back. Right. Uh, if you didn't want to pay me back, then we came up with a schedule like maybe you give me 500 a week or whatever the case may be. So you could, most of the time, if you know somebody, you give them three points. Like say, I'm only using $1,000 this way. It's easy for everybody to understand. So you use three points. That's only $30 a week on $1,000 you get till the guy gives you the $1,000 back. So you're really being good to them. They might go as low as a point and a half depending on how close you are with the person and you know you don't want to hurt nobody. But if you want to get somebody and you want to lock them in, then you charge them a bad number so that this way now they, they're into you, what you would say. Like, yeah, you're into me now. You know what I mean? Okay. But just to be clear. Yes. You're giving someone a favor by saying three points. That's three percentage points yes. per week. Yes. Which is around 12, 13% per month. <laughs> per year, this is about 150%. Okay. This it is not up. a great loan. You're not really doing anyone a favor. If you go to any bank, you know, you can get a loan for what? I mean, even a credit card is like maybe 25% per year. So so this is way more expensive. It's actually 25% a month they, they charge you on credit cards. Sometimes even 29% a month. Per month? Yeah. If you look at the back of the credit cards and people will go, hey, listen, why am I paying so much interest every month? I know because I had a credit card and I said to them, you guys are charging me 29%. Can't you get me down to 10 or I'm going to cancel the card? They get me down to 10. I tried. <laughs> I believe it's per year, and I believe it's, you know, cut down, you know, divided by 12 per month. I don't think you're paying 24% per month. I, I'm, it, I'm it, well, it's a 24% interest now. Interest per year, though. You sure it's a year? Pretty sure. I won't, I won't disagree Pretty with you, sure but I think it was a year. month. But... Yeah, 24% from, you know, if that compounds, you're going to owe thousands of dollars on $100 within about <laughs> a year or so. So, yeah, it has to be per month. It has to be per year, I mean. Yeah, okay. exactly. My point is, is that loan sharking is way, way higher than an actual loan from a bank or some other loan agency or something like that. It is also a hard money loan. It's a most hard of, money loan. Most I of understand. These people... I'm not knocking you for it. Get your money. I'm just saying that this is not a good deal. Well, You're not doing anyone fa any favors for 3%. That's all I'm saying. You're 100% correct because yeah. by the time somebody came to us or like to a guy They've like They've exhausted me, all their other choices. Exactly. I, I get it. And I, I understand. I won't take your house from you depending on how much you borrow. Mm -hmm. So at least you get to keep all your stuff and hopefully most of your body parts too if you don't pay, you know what I'm saying? Right. Or if you pay. So what would happen when people didn't pay? Back in the days when my father showed it to me, we used that fear factor. In other words, they knew I would come and hurt them or whatever. Um, but lo and behold, my friend Frank Salerno, who was connected to Mike Salerno, who was in the Lucchese crime family as well, he told me, he says, you, you, you don't hurt anybody anymore. You, if you borrow 5,000, 10,000, 1,000, make sure they got something double to 
to use it. In other words, I give you 5,000, now you give me something that's worth 10. You yeah. missed the first payment, I cash it in, or I sell it, or whatever it is that you gave yeah. me. Collateral. And that's it. Yeah. But realistically, I'll still say you still owe me money, even though <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is how it all, you know. Because don't forget too, when you're a wise guy, even though I was not full-fledged member yet, you're supposed to be above all these other people. You're supposed to be above the regular civilian people. And so if you came to me, I mean, I'm doing you a favor. Look, right. I had a book. How many excuses people would, would <laughs> oh, Joey, I'm sorry. I can't believe it. My wife left me, this left me. I says, okay, but where's my money? You still worked. You got your job, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, my dog ate. I said, okay, where's the dog? Why? I said, well, because I'm going to cut the dog, the check out of the dog's stomach. I want my money. <laughs> so it's like they all came up with all excuses, you right. know? It's funny. Now, your father killed four people? About four people, yes, that we, wow. that I'm pretty aware of. It was, uh, I had wound up getting the Freedom of Information Act, and so there was about four in there, too. A couple of people I know. Did your dad ever admit any of those murders to you? Never. Never. No, well, only one, I think it was not the last one, but it was a guy, Alex Sacconi, and I knew he was going to kill him because he came to my house late at night about two Dirty in the morning, woke my grandfather up and stuff like that. And uh, and Alex Sacconi, I could not beat him in a fight, n nor probably me or my father could. He was one of those guys that was like a big, strappy dude. Plus, he also had legitimate pa papers that said he was crazy. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And he actually had pieces of skin taken out from him because he had a fight with another guy who was actually tough and they started biting each other. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, this guy was, yeah, Alex was no joke. And he used to be a bouncer and he used to pick on all the guys that were big that used to walk through, give him a dirty look and all of this. But I knew my father was going to kill him. My grandfather kept saying, bring him in the house because we were going to get him in the basement. But he had a guy waiting for him in the car, so we couldn't do that. Uh, but I knew shortly after that, then he died because my father explained exactly what happened to him. And the only person that would really know what happened to him, you had to be there. Okay, what happened to him? Well, he got shot and he he still didn't almost like die right away, but he got shot and he still was kind of like tough about it, but they ran him over a few times too. By the, I think it was in the Yonker Cemetery they had him. He was, dro he was dro drove there by somebody that we knew too. Now, I assume by you saying all this, your father passed away? Yes. Okay, so we're not putting any murders on anyone right no, now. No, I'm not going to. Okay, no, yeah, right. no. Uh, Just check. Uh, I don't even know the guy who drove him there. I don't think, I don't know if he's alive or not, but I don't recall his name. Right, because... <laughs> I guess when you were seven, your dad told you that if you ever killed someone, to do it by yourself. Actually, it was my grandfather who told me. Oh, your grandfather that. said that. Yeah. My grandfather took me. I was like, like, like you said, about seven years old. And he said to me, he says, hey, Joseph. He, well, they called me by my middle name, which is Stephen. He says, Joseph, Stephen, come here. He says, you're ever going to have to kill anybody. You always do it by yourself. So I, I looked at him. He goes, you don't know why? I said, no, why, Grandpa? He said, because are you going to tell on yourself? And I'm 63 years old, going to be in December. I still never forgot that. Because it was really a realization of what, you know, that's like serious stuff. You know what I mean? And it, But it makes sense. Everything in this life is true, whether you want to try to spin it any way you like. But that really is the best way to do things, by yourself. Now, your grandfather killed a man with a mini sledgehammer? My great-grandfather did. Great-grandfather. Yeah, okay. he was, they used to, back in the days, uh, they used to go to the markets and stuff like that. But I guess my great-grandfather took this guy's spot or whatever. I don't know. He got mad, the guy, and grabbed my great-grandfather, and he had that little sledgehammer. It was one of those small ones like that. He hit him over the head once, uh, but, you know, they killed him. And so he ran away to the cemetery. Uh, he slept in the cemetery for three days. And uh, it was self-defense. And back then, there was no big court dates, no none of this baloney that I got going on now. And so the cops came to my house and said, uh, you can tell them to come back home now. It's okay. Okay. And it was, and nothing, nothing never happened. It was squashed. Yeah, the good That's old the days. difference. <laughs> right? I know, four, but, four cell phones and cameras and e, the internet e, e, and everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even witnesses used to say, no, it was just a fair fight type right. of deal. Listen, if you, if you and I were kids and growing up and we got into a fight, you, the fight was over and that was it. We either probably yeah. become friends later or something or whatever. Well, at one point, it was required for a mafia guy to actually kill someone to be made. It, it is most of, most of the time, yes. There are certain circumstances where uh, people are not killing people to still get made. I believe uh, 
I think I don't. I, uh, I'm not quoting anything. I don't think John Jr. ever killed anybody to be made. I can't swear to that because I don't know. Mm-hmm. Also, there was a guy named Greg De Palma, who mm-hmm. was another gangster. Who, yeah. His son never killed anybody, from what I understand, to get paid because supposedly I had heard that they he his father gave fifty thousand dollars to get him straightened out, and unfortunately, it was a bad thing because he wound up killing himself in prison, killing himself. Well, you yourself mm-hmm. in your you know late teens, early twenties, were you trying to be made? I I didn't I didn't really have anything to do with it back then. Uh, I was kind of like a. Even though I was still loaning money a little bit here and there, nothing big like a lot of these other guys did. I was just a guy that was, maybe I was a little wild in my in my days. Not like a not like we were Gene Barella, like we, you know he was a little crazy back in those days. But I would fight anybody if I had to, or do anything that I had to do. But I wasn't looking to be a wise guy. Uh, I thought that was something that was very hard to do as a young guy. Uh, also because I just thought that they had that secret society. You gotta remember one thing too, in my age bracket now, back in those days, those it was very more alluring, very more secretive, more mysterious. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a lot more respect back then. Uh, people feared them back then. And so I didn't want no part of that life. I was, listen, I started smoking pot when I was 11 years old. I stopped when I was 14, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. I was like a pothead. But later on in life, things changed, unfortunately. Well, and not for the better. Well, the mafia had been uh, connected with the trucking business. Oh, for yes. For quite a while. And your dad was involved in that? He was. He was connected. We had a place in Queens. It was called B-Way Trucking. Uh, I think that guy's name was Tommy, too, if I'm not mistaken. Big, heavy set guy. What a nice guy. T- what beautiful home. Nice business. Uh, I went to the. I went to his b- barbecue in the backyard, and it was uh, a fire started or whatever. And his son said, "Oh, Dad, a big fire!" And I just put it out right out. And I was like, "Don't ever get nervous. Don't you know? Don't panic. Be afraid, but don't be panicking." Mm-hmm. So they were like, "Yeah, I was like a hero." As a matter of fact, they bought my father a Mercedes Benz, a three eighty SL back then, two door. You mm-hmm. know, here's a guy, my father, going down there protecting them, getting money every week, and they still bought him a Mercedes. Mm-hmm. That's how much they liked my father. Well, there was a. Always in the trucking company, as you know, like you said, there was another, I guess, some other group or something, whatever, tried to come in. And uh, this guy was tattooed up. And you could tell he was somebody. And he came with a couple of guys. My father said, okay, we got to go do something. And there it was. We, I strapped up. My father had a gun. Tommy even had a gun, too, believe it or not. I didn't think he was that kind of guy. My father went by himself. I was kind of like hiding behind these boxes because you know, I wanted to see what was going on. But I was ready to do what I had to do to protect my father. And they never came back. Mm. So I, ha- I I don't know what exactly what happened to, to that trucking company or anything, but when my father went away on the lamb, he had he gave me a few things to do. And I went to other trucking companies that my father had, which I never even knew he had. And I started collecting money. As a matter of fact, the guy gave me an envelope. It was Christmas time. And I said, oh, okay, thanks. Good to see you. I'll see you next month. He says, well, listen, I always take care of you. If he gave me another $700, he gave me my father another $700 for Christmas. Imagine that. Hmm. I said, he says, he's doing okay. They missed him. <laughs> they, I know, Vlad, they missed him. Right. And I said, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I'll make sure it gets to him. But it never got to him. I, I, I kept it with me. I didn't know who to pay it to because I was meeting a guy at the Jacob Javits Center on the corner. Uh and then one day he just said to me, he says, okay, don't go to the companies anymore. I guess somebody, you know, now it's my father's gone and somebody else took it over. But right. I did it for a couple of months anyway. But it's basically extortion. Probably, yeah. I would say so, yeah. Right. I mean, people are paying you for protection. You, you know, you know that, that that's part is true. But to be honest with you, though, in one way, if you're, a, if you're like a guy like uh, Trump and you got Secret Service, you're paying them to protect you too. Is that really extortion too? If you think, I'm not, I mean, I'm not comparing apples with oranges, but I'm just saying to you, like, if you have something like a truck company that, you know, people are going to bother you and you like somebody, say you and I, I'm just going to use this because, you know, and you said, you know, Joe, I like you, you know, I get problems once in a while. Would you mind hanging around me a couple of days a week? Sure, Vlad, you, I'll take care of you. Okay, no problem. Is that really extortion? Well, no, but for example, you know, I have security. Oh, I'm sure. You know, yeah. So, so. If I tell my security, hey, I don't need your uh, services this month, they say no problem. 
when you tell the mafia that you don't need protection this month, well, it becomes in lies, a problem. Yeah, they, well, <laughs> okay. therein lies the difference. Yes, because it's yeah. either we're go- well, think about it like this: it's either we're going to protect you, or you're going to try to get somebody else. Now, are you going to really like these people? Because we're not being greedy; we're being gentlemen. I mean, if you're making a million dollars a year, and we're making on your protection money fifty thousand a year, hundred thousand dollars, that really that bad? Now the other guys are going to come in and they want almost half your money. Hmm. And so it all depends on who it is. Like some people in the Genovese family are more more gentlemen. Some people maybe from the Lucchese family are like greedy bastards. Yeah. It all depends. Well, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared at one point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I've heard all types of different stories about what happened to Jimmy <laughs> Hoffa. Mm. I think half a dozen people I've interviewed had their own version of the story and the versions don't really coincide with each other. Do you have any idea what happened to Jimmy Hoffa? I know he's dead. Yeah. That's it. That's the true. most person I think I thought that might have had the most best information on Jimmy might have been Mike Francis, Michael Francis. Yeah. Uh, but though that's, listen, when they want to make you disappear and sometimes they can keep a good secret, I, they'll never find them. Yeah. They're never going to find them. There was actually a good movie that Sylvester Stallone did with him, the movie called Fist. Great movie. Hmm. It was, I think it was a spinoff on what mattered, what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. But you see- you get you get involved with these people, and no matter how high you up on the totem pole, you can still go. At least back then, too, it was more powerful back then. Well, there's a guy named Vic Maturo. Yes. And at the time, Vincent the Chin Gigante put a green light on Vic because he was allegedly a snitch. And it turned out to be that he was not allegedly as such he was. Right. And that's the reason why the FBI was so involved in trying to find out who killed my father. I mean, killed uh, my father killed Vic. Because the guy actually, Mickey Generoso, was actually the guy that called my father to bring Vic down to Brooklyn. And he did. And they must have talked to him and probably made it look like uh, everything was okay. You know how they do. They, uh, but I guess whatever answers he gave them weren't good enough. And sure enough, he did turn out that he was working with the federal government. And then my father, I believe, was the last one with some other guy. And they found him hanging in the garage now. They ruled it as a suicide. But that's one of the, no, it wasn't a suicide. My father's actually, before he went away on the lamp, said, they're going to try to get me for this murder. That's when I knew, you know, what they did. Okay. So your dad took the hit Mm -hmm. and killed Vic Maturo. Yep. Were there other people involved? One other guy, yeah. I don't okay. know if he's still alive or dead. I don't okay. know. So we'll, we'll leave his name out of here. Absolutely. Um, so that murder occurs. And your father, after that, felt that he was marked by the FBI and there was potentially a hit on him. It, 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 Vlad, this is kind of weird. I came home and my father was upstairs and he says, uh, come here. I went to his room and he showed me a card of, I don't know what the FBI agent, who what the name was, but he said, I said, what's this dad? He said, well, they came here and I wasn't home. And I says, well, what did they want? He said, well, they said that they intercepted a call that we got to get rid of JB. Now JB, my father was known as Joey Beeper because he used to carry the Beeper back in those <laughs> days or JB. Me, I was known as Joey Joe Nose because I had a big nose. Uh, anyway, and everybody used to like to punch me for some reason. I don't know why, but anyway, uh, he showed me the card, and I says, "Oh, he, I says a hit." He says, "Yeah." They said they intercepted a call, and by law, if they hear that somebody's marked for you know to get hit or killed or whatever, they have to say uh, let you know. So they asked him. I said, "If you want to come in and talk about anything or whatever, we can elaborate more and everything." My father said, no, I'm okay. I appreciate it. And they said, no, keep the card. So I said, what's up, dad? He said, I'm not worried about it. Now, that's what he said. Now, was he really worried about it or not? I don't know. Because you got to remember, my family was known not to tell me anything. My mother used to tell my sister or anybody else in the family, don't tell your brother or my son anything because I would, anything came to my about my family. I flew off the handle and I didn't know what was what. I, I saw black. I, I didn't care about anybody would bother anybody in my family. That was it because uh, I loved my mother and father that much. Okay. So the murder occurs. Your dad gets word that there might be a hit on him. Correct. From the FBI though. From the FBI. Yes. So he decides to go on the run. He came to me one day and he said, listen, uh, 
he, Joseph, he, he gave me some money, gave me the addresses to go see the people at the trucking company. And he says, I got to go away for a little while. He says, go get money. So I went to the safety deposit box. I got him $70,000 cash. I gave it to him. I said, dad, but why do you got to run? I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to tell on anybody, you know. He says, no, he's, it's not that. He says, first of all, he don't want to go away again. He did enough time. And he said, he says, look, he says, uh, sometimes when you go away, it makes people feel more easier over here. Like, you know, like mm. kind of like makes them think like nothing's going to happen. So I said, all right, dad. So he went away, uh, stayed at a friend's house and then jumped on the plane the next day. Nobody knew where he went. And uh, the, supposedly it was another guy out there on the lamb or hiding for a long time that he knew. I don't know the guy's name. Even if I did, I wouldn't say, but I don't know. And uh, he went there. He went to, actually went to Honduras. Right. So now your dad is living in Honduras. Yep. Do you actually know that at the time or yes. did you find that out afterwards? I, no, I, I didn't know when he was going to leave to go to Honduras. But you knew he was in Honduras. He Yes. He just told uh, his girlfriend or whatever had to get a phone number. I used to have to go to pay phone back in those days. It would a bag full of quarters. It was like three or four dollars each time. To, to call him at the phone number, he would ask me certain things, and I would tell him what was going on. And I knew that's when I knew he was on Honduras. Um, he actually went there because he said it was kind of a more of a free reign. He said, "Look, if they come to try to get me here, there's going to be a shootout at the OK Corral," was his exact words. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, I talked to him a couple of times, uh, and then there was a time when I tried to call the number, and it it, it, would, it wasn't connected anymore. Hmm. So I figured I'd find out something must have happened. I don't know what. Right. Well, ultimately, your dad was found dead in Honduras. And it was sort of a, a weird situation. You're not sure whether he died from natural causes because he was sick during that time, right? He, he was sick. Supposedly, he wanted to come back and get a, I think they said he needed a triple bypass surgery. And um, I, he spoke to somebody in my family. So now I, it's kind of, it's, he, I got some, like you said, you had so many stories about Mike Francis's name and stuff like that. Who wants to call him by his right name? In my time, I went to people who I loved and trusted. I went to my cousin, I called him uncle, is Pat Patty. It was actually supposed to be made twice. And he said to me, he said, he said everything washes ashore you're gonna find out one day and i said well geez uncle pat i said i'd like to know now if i could i, I did this when i came home for my first bid because i saw the autopsy pictures he said that that scar is there to hide the stab wounds hmm. now i loved my uncle my cousin whatever you want to call him i believed him the FBI told me when they interviewed me that time and showed me the pictures of my father, said he was murdered. Did he really die? I saw the I saw the the autopsy report from Honduras. He said he died of a drug overdose. Hmm. Vlad, to this day, I don't know really what happened. Had all the years I spent undercover. A dear friend of mine said to me, maybe I just shouldn't know. Maybe it was not meant for me to know the truth. Well, the FBI told you that three men went to go visit your dad. They did. Hunters. They told me they went under my last name, Barone. Hmm. And I said to him, I says, you mean to tell me you don't know who they were? That the cameras in the airport, nothing? No signatures, no nothing. Now, why did they tell me this? I don't know. From from what I understand, and I didn't realize this, but my attorney on my second bid told me that Vincent Bazzuti, who was the my handler for 18 years, was a, a some kind of a, a one of those people who can evaluate you and know. Maybe he told me this to to make me get mad and to point me and like to trigger something inside of me too. That could be as well. But they see they also knew this about the part where they went to go arrest him one time. They sent word to the officials in Honduras, but the officials were being paid by my father 
And so they alerted him and that's when he moved from one place to another. And that's why I couldn't call him. So I said, wow, they know that, you know? I mean, look, are they all knowing people? No, but they knew that. Well, I'm sorry for your loss, man. Thank you. Yeah, I lost my dad some years back and it's tough. I think as a son losing his dad, it's always, it's a hard one. There's, you know, there's always a last time for something. Yeah. If I knew, maybe I would have hugged him harder. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know what I mean. Yeah, I know know what you mean. Apologize. Yeah, no, it's okay. Take your time. It hasn't changed inside of me, you know? Well, by 1991, you were around 30 years old. You get locked up for extortion and gun possession. That's correct, yes. And you were facing 10 years. I think so. About 10 years, they said, yeah. So you were allegedly robbing drug dealers, and the guns you were using had the serial numbers scratched off. At one time, I was robbing some drug dealers, but not like a big... uh... Like some guys were really doing it. Like I guess you heard of those that group called the Cowboys. Mm-hmm. Those guys were pretty rough, and they were they were no joke. I was just robbing them on the corners and stuff like that. You know, they'd bring me. I'd show them a roll of twenties and fifties, but I wrapped it in ones, and then I'd only give them twenty dollars in rolls, and they'd give me all the cocaine and stuff like that. So, uh, but the serial numbers on most of my guns were scratched off back then. Okay. Now, the extortion part of your arrest uh, came from a guy that you were shaking down for 30000 that owed you 30000 that is? It was supposed to be that he owed me 30000 His brother really owed me more of the money. Uh, they didn't get along good and stuff like that. And I think my loan actually grew up to like that much because I wasn't being paid. Um, there was a few things I tacked on that I shouldn't have, you know, uh, like a gift I gave him. I gave him back in those days the Louis XIV, the... the it was in that really expensive thing that's yeah. probably like 3500 now. I was just tacking on everything, you know. And so I, I said it was about 30000 So I went to go see his brother. And his brother uh, got messed up a little bit. Not really that much. He got scared. So he went to the FBI. Well, didn't you guys put a, a phone cord around his neck and put a gun to his head? Yeah. Uh, the phone the phone cord around, it was, it, was the, it was the telephone cord went around the guy's neck, Eddie's neck, Eddie's dead now too. Uh, and then my friend pointed the gun at him, says, give us the money. And my other friend who's dead now too, Biff lifted up the whole desk. He was strong. Biff had hit each one of his fingers were probably like two of mine. Hmm. He was an animal, an sure. animal. We used to work for, he was a bouncer at Sue's Rendezvous. And, oh, okay, and, yeah, yep, I used to go he, there. Yeah, he, got, he actually got shot in the chest with a 32 and still didn't die. Damn. Didn't even go through his bone plate. Wow. Okay, so yeah, he was tough. He was tough. Right. Well, but the guy that you guys were strangling and had a gun to his head was wearing a wire? Not then. Ah. Um, we caught him. I caught him. He was an accountant. I caught him uh, up at his office and everything. And he was, they, they were, they were, both of the brothers were evading me. Uh, we we could have came to some agreement. I liked them, you know, but they didn't as usual, you know, uh, nobody wants to part with money. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyways, after that, uh, after he got the choking and the scaring like that and everything, he must have went to the FBI. And of course, they they used that as a interstate commerce or whatever they say it is but because hmm. I stopped him from doing something. I don't know. You know, they give you all those. They keep trying to tack on more stuff is what I'm saying. But uh, what happened was he was wearing a wire on his own brother, huh. who actually, my, the guy Dennis his, was his brother. Uh, was doing other things that I didn't know about, wire fraud and stuff like this, but he wore a wire on it. Was It was supposed to meet him at the Thomas C. Bible Funeral Home. Well, I was driving down and I was with my girlfriend at the time and, and I seen his car and I knew the guys that owned the funeral home. So I said, oh, let me pull over real quick. There's Eddie. So I got out, I put my sap gloves on. You know what the sap gloves are, right? No. Oh, sap gloves are weighted gloves like they, back in the days they had lead in it, but now they put oh, sand in them. Yeah, okay. and it, it actually helps you because I broke so many bones in my hands over people's heads. I wanted to wear this not to break my hand. Plus it actually makes you punch a little bit harder. And so I said, hey, Eddie, come outside. I pounded him a few times He and you heard me saying, where's my money? You go, with, well, you hit the ground and everything. And it was a wooden, wooden porch. So when he hit the ground, it actually went like this because I was so skinny back then. And then the FBI arrested me right there. Okay, so you get arrested, and do you actually get sentenced? 
No, I, I, I was fighting the case for about, oh, a while. I was okay. actually had a, I had a public defender at the time. Uh, and uh, so she says, all right, Joe, we're going to, don't worry about it. I'll get you, I'll get you out of here. So I asked her to finally try to get me two years or whatever. She says, at first she says, you're going to be three. I said, see if you go for the two. I mean, I'll, I'll do the deal right now. So she says, well, may I go do the three? But then she came back. It was a little harder. So then I hired a Bruce Bendish from White Plains. So while you're sitting in jail awaiting the trial, the FBI meets up with you. What happened was after I hired Bruce Bendish, we went to court and Bruce says, I need to go over the case. We need about several months to go over it. So naturally, and it was okay because he said it, and you probably noticed yourself, after you, you, you're you sitting in jail, you're doing the time, it all gets accounted to whatever time you do get or not, or yeah. whatever. So it's okay. It wasn't that bad. But that's when I got moved from Otisville, New York to MCC, New York. And uh, I, I was actually facing a superseding indictment because my, they arrested my uncle uh, and they put me with him in the loan sharking business. One of the, somebody ratted on him and, and me at the same time, whatever. So I had to take a superseding and that's what I thought I was there for. Well, lo and behold, I'm in there and uh, uh, Vicar Musso was in there. He was the boss of the Lucchese family. And I met him in Otisville. Somebody said that he never was, he was too high profile to be in Otisville, but he was in Otisville. I met him. Matter of fact, I know because I talked to him. That's how I met him. I didn't even meet him in the street. Well, he, I'm going there and I'm with this guy, Mikey Shades, and we go there to the bus to MCC. And who was there was Vic. And he goes, hey, I said, hey, Vic, how you doing? I didn't know who he was. I just thought he was an old timer guy. Ne you know, look, I'm supposed to know some people. I didn't know him. Mm -hmm. I go into the cell with Mikey Shades and Mikey says to me, he says, wow, you never believe it by looking at him. I says, no, you don't. You know, I'm going along with it. I don't want to like, like, like I'm a dope. He says, this guy, he get rid of you like that. I went, oh shit. So now I'm thinking like, okay, so I get out, I'm talking to him over the, he's going to trial and everything. He says, look, Joey, he had like that real, real hard accent. He says, Joey, he says, look, he says, I'm going to be on the trial. He says, I'm not going to be around all day. He says, but I don't want nobody sitting at this table. I'm going to give you the combination to my locker and anything you want, you help yourself. He says, I said, no, Vic, I'll wait for you to come home. So I would make meals from him, get other meals from him when he came home, which he had already, but we got close. Well, sure enough, now they're going to interview me, which I had no idea about. He calls me. He's, I said, what's up, Vic? I says, he said, look, he says, the FBI is going to come see you. And he says, you sit there, you listen. And that's it. He says, at the end of everything, he says, you tell him, I love to help you, but I'm not even in a position to help myself. Now, this is a real, real wise guy telling me this, okay? <laughs> and I still, after all these years, never forgot that. And I said, okay, Vic. I, I still took it like on, a great, on the chin. But sure enough, I go to the bullpen. I'm thinking I'm going to court. I don't think this. Yeah, he's right. I figure he's making this up. Well, I'm walking down this ha hallway with the marshals and three guys are over there. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, two guys are at the end of the hallway. He, they said, okay, you got to go with them now. I went, okay. And I, and I walked and they grabbed me and they brought me into the room. And that's when I saw my attorney, the U.S. attorney, the uh, assistant U.S. attorney, which was Benjamin Rosenberg, I believe his name was. He, uh, he has his own practice now from what I understand. Uh, and the two agents, Michael Harkins and Vincent Pizzuti. And that's when oh, everything took place. I says, well, can you do me a favor? Can can I have a minute with my attorney? They said, yeah. They walked out of the room because it was like a room wall, no windows, nothing like that. They weren't going to worry about me jumping out. Anyways, I said, Bruce, what's going on? He says, Jody called me last night, told me I had to be here today. I says, okay. I said, well, I don't want to talk to these people. He says, what do you got to do, Joe? You got nothing? To, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bruce is very funny. You have other plans? Yeah, ex exactly. He says, he says, you sit here, you listen a little bit. I says, all right, Bruce, all right. So he called them back in. They came back in. They said, listen, Joe, we want to talk to you. I said, okay. And then they says, oh, would you mind moving the, you want to come move your handcuffs to the front? I said, sure. They moved it to the front. He started talking to me. You know, Joe, this kind of life, blah, 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 blah. You know, all the, the baloney that they give you. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to it one ear out the other. And then finally they said, Joe, we'd like to show you something. That's the reason why they moved my hand to the front. And they showed me a stack of photos of the cemetery of my father with the autopsy and everything was about this thick. And that's when it all started for me. So they're basically telling you if you cooperate, they'll tell you how your father died? They didn't tell me because they still didn't know. The only thing that they knew about was like what I we previously discussed about. They said there was three men yeah. and that my father never took them back to his villa. Okay, he had a villa I didn't even know about. 
but he would always eat the, meet them in the mall. When I think of Honduras, I'm thinking of glass, grass huts and everything. I don't even know it's built up like a city. But anyway, he would always meet them in the mall. And they said, but this particular time, he took them back to his villa. And then we went to go arrest him that Sunday and we found him on the floor dead. So that kind of, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I have no proof of any of this, but isn't that kind of coincidental? Yeah. You know, did they, did somebody else know that my father was going to be visited by the FBI and did kill him not to talk? Or did he really just die because he was had a bad heart? Yeah. Vlad, I don't know. I don't know. And but that changed my whole I, I was furious. I was furious. So you decided to cooperate with the FBI because of what happened to your father? That's correct. Now I didn't do it at that second. I didn't I was too emotional. I was I, I'm not gonna lie, I was sad, I was crying. They 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 gave me they left the room. I was there with my attorney. I was sad, I was brokenhearted. I thought about it for a while and I was angry. And I got really angry. So Bruce came to see me again. I went back. I got shipped out of, uh, I got shipped out of uh, MCC. I think before they, I saw them again. I went back to Otisville, and then I told Bruce. I says, "Okay, let me see what they got to say for me." And so that's when I had an interview with them, and they give you all the. Uh, we can't really do much for you, but we'll tell tell the judge of anything that you cooperated and it helped us in any way or this kind of stuff and. You know, we can lower your sentence because I think I was facing 10 years in the beginning because of what you want you having a gun is bad. Uh, I think was an, was an offense. Scratching the serial numbers off is another federal crime and all of this other stuff. OK, so you agree to work with the feds. Yes. So in the world of the mafia, you now become a rat. Correct. How did that sit with you, considering that your dad was a made man? your grandfather, your mother's side. These are all, you know, hardcore mafia guys who never did that. And now you're doing it. That's right. How did that sit with you? Not well. If, if it sat well with me, I could sit here and say to you, I don't care or it doesn't mean anything. But at the time, I felt like, look, I still get bad dreams of it. I'm still in counseling, still, still seeing a therapist. I still have PTSD. I still have everything, all because of this cooperation. And it's not because I liked it or whatever. I didn't want to go against some people I knew, of course, obviously. But I, that it wasn't who I was. I would have, if my mother and father was alive, I would have never cooperated with anybody. But. This seemed to be, at my time, at that frame of mind, that was the only way I could find out maybe who killed my father. Because it wasn't like I was going to be able to walk up to a wise guy and say, hey, you know who killed my father? <laughs> you know, it's not a kind of a question, do you know what really happened to my father? Uh, you know, this is not something you do. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you, had, if you asked my captain at that time, Dominic Sicali, he'd tell you straight out, I never asked him one question about anything. Hmm because you don't do that. Okay, so now you're working with the feds mm -hmm. and you start feeding them information about what's going on in the prison. In the prison, yes. Okay. And the feds want to know who killed a capo named Ralphie- Capola. Capola. Mm -hmm. And you actually helped out on this. I told them what I knew about it, yeah. And that was? Well, basically, the, the, the two guys are still out there. They're, they're, I think one of them is a captain in the Genovese family. One, I think, is still a soldier. Um, but Ralphie Coppola was, I grew up with Ralphie. Ralphie and I had fights together, and he was way tougher than me. Actually could have been, I know you're not going to believe this, but he actually could have been a professional baseball player. Hmm. All right, a talent scout came to see him and wanted him, but he wanted to be a gangster. Ralphie was a good-looking guy, good with his hands, but... What happened was he just took that road. Well, he thought he was he was doing some things I had heard later on. I don't know how true it is, but he was skimming money. Supposedly, he was actually nervous about it. His, actually, his sister was nervous about it. Well, uh, they, they called him down. Uh, I made a joke about it a little bit to kind of like ease my mind a little bit. Because I said to the FBI when I told him, I said they thought he was going to get, he thought he was going to get bumped up, but instead he got bumped off. 
because he, they thought he was going to probably become a captain because he was so far up Barney's ass. They used to make fun of my father. He used to make fun of him because Barney Balama was was their boss, and uh, was and they used to like they would all go out to dinner and everything. They used to say, "Leave that table or leave that seat for Ralphie because he likes to be close to Barney because he was so far up his ass." And I don't blame him. Barney was that kind of guy, you know. But uh, needless to say, uh, he never came back. They never found him. And okay. nobody talks about it. Well, there was also a uh, double homicide with a guy named Eddie Kavanov. Eddie, Eddie Kavanov, yeah. Okay. What was that situation? So, and let me also just add this, if I, if I may. When I did stuff like in the prison and stuff like that, and even with Eddie, what I'm about to tell you, I didn't know these people. So to me, I wasn't hurting anybody I knew, but I figured it was still a way to get closer. You know what I mean? And so I don't say that that's making it right or wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not trying to justify things. But I'm just saying it the way it is. Eddie Kavanaugh, for me, I got a little kind of talking to him and everything like that. He was with another guy, Ralph Giordano, in the prison. Ralph Giordano got the funeral home in the Bronx, too. Eddie's from the Bronx. Used to hang around with a guy, Bobby Blue Eyes. Well, Eddie told me about the, you know, he told me what he was in there for and what happened in the whole nine yards. And uh, he was... He was dealing a lot of drugs, and he was going to whack these two guys, uh, this guy with the, was a drug dealer with him. Uh, it was actually one guy. And this guy, Bobby, wanted, well, not Bobby, but one of his friends wanted to take the ride with him. And he said, no, don't come, don't worry about me, just go with this guy by myself, Well, the guy insisted. Well, unfortunately, they took him to, uh, the guys got shot in a, in a driveway where two of my friends live, actually. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, they were over there, it was, it was a, there was a state trooper barracks there, a large mob, my Marinick, and Nourishell police because, and of course now DEA and ATF because it's all all in one right there in Larchmont, New York, borderline of Larchmont, Nourishell. It's like crazy the way they, if you got one side of the street is one thing and one side is the other one. This is how stupid the the mail code is. But he put two bullets in him, but his friend he shot his own friend too because he was there and he didn't want to leave him as a witness. But he told me that the the the, the, the shot was so loud he couldn't hear. He jogged up the block. The blood was all over his white sweatsuit. He took the sweatsuit off. He called his girlfriend. She came, picked him up, gave him a change of clothes, and that was the end of that. And unfortunately, I told the FBI that. Okay. And, I mean, over the time that you were cooperating, you identified over 1,000 members of organized crime. Probably, that the, yeah. That the feds didn't really know about. Probably, yes. So you were basically saying, okay, this is so-and-so, and he's down with this mafia crew. This is, mm -hmm. you know, this person, he's down with these guys. Some, some guys point. coming up that I knew about or heard about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, at any point, did anyone suspect you of cooperating? Not one person. Not one person. No, because, see, I I, I could, I, I was, uh, I called it the Joe Show role, you know? It was easy to kind of mimic my father in that life, you know? Uh Plus, listen, I was very fortunate. Thank God I was not stupid. Matter of fact, I think that's why the FBI were jealous of me because I was able to infiltrate better than they ever could. Hmm. They were so dumb, I probably can give them lessons. Um, but to be honest with you, uh, I, you know, I was able to, thank God, I was able to handle myself to some degree. I wasn't the toughest guy there. I'm not going to lie about that. But I was able to do what I had to do. And there was a part of me because when you're with the certain people, Later on, as I got close to like, say, like guys like Dominic, when I was getting close to them guys, now it was a kind of a, now I felt accepted. I felt wanted. I felt like, you know, and it was kind of a really good distraction than working for the FBI. You know, I felt more at home, if you, if you know what I'm saying? Because you grow up around that life, you feel more, I don't know, accepted. I, I can't explain it. Um, so I was able to, I was doing things, you know, I was going to places, doing whatever I had to do, whatever my captain ordered me or whatever I had to do, I was doing. I was there for him any minute, any time. Well, even though you cooperated with the feds, mm -hmm. you still end up doing four years. Yes. Later on, they arrested me on bogus charges. They, right. Well, they I mean, but the, the time you were doing at that time, it was four years instead of 10, The right? first time there, they still gave me four years in prison. I right. did three years, six months to the door. I didn't take the halfway house. Okay. So they didn't really do me no favors. Look, for what I did, look, you got Sammy the Bull did five years. He killed supposedly 19 guys. Good for him. He got out in five years. I mean, he gave up big people and he testified. I mean, it was a lot different than what I did. But he still only did for five years after all those murders, whether he's involved in shooting or pulling the trigger or what. Okay? 
Look, I was with a guy, they says he robbed a guy of $700,000. He had some real estate business with him. So this kid, Paulie, when I was in, in, in Michigan, my land, Michigan, we used to call it Milan. So he says he got on a stand and the prosecutor said, did you have a real estate deal with this guy, Sammy? He says, yeah, I did. He says, well, whatever happened to that real estate deal? He says, well, he, you know, he, everything he had to forfeit because he never showed up for, to, the, to the closing. He says, well, why didn't he show up for the closing? Because he killed him. So he actually kept the deposit of $700,000. All of this stuff, they let him go for five years, which I'm okay with. I don't have nothing against Sammy. I don't know him. But yet me, I still got four years hmm. for, the, for the information that I gave them. Murders that were unsolved. Well, they say that Sammy killed 19 people, but you said it's actually 23? I was with a guy in prison, Frankie Smith. Frankie Smith and I were both in the box together on my first bid too. For I, I think I only spent like a, a couple of weeks, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it was in the box at Otisville. And so it was actually Frankie Smith told me that he killed these two brothers. I don't know who it was. Now, is that true or not? I don't know. I, But this is what Frankie Smith told me. And Frankie Smith wound up cooperating too. And Frankie Smith was another tough guy. You know, yeah, yeah I, I don't think I could have beat him in a fight. We almost had a fight in Otisville just looking at each other. So, but I didn't care, you know, what am I supposed to do? I'm in prison. So uh, that's actually who told me uh, that he killed more than 19 people. Okay, so you think it's about 23. Yeah, and don't forget when it came out in the papers, I was living with this girl who was connected to the Gambino family. And I said, you know, it was more than 19. And then sure enough, supposedly he had some problem with the deal that he made with the FBI because they said he lied about certain things. So who knows? I don't knows? know. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not going against them by any means, just yeah. so you know. Uh, okay. So 1995, you're around 34 years old. You get out of prison. Yes. I think I was 30, yeah, 33 or 34. Yes. Okay. So after going through this bid and cooperating, you start to cozy up to the Bananos. Yeah. Um, when I was in Michigan, my land, Michigan, I met a guy named Bobby DeFeo. I also met Johnny Artuso whose father was supposed to be in on the, on the post Paul Castellano hit. Bobby DeFeo and uh, me got kind of close in the joint. And then we went out and we, uh, he started, he, he knew uh, Anthony Spiro, who, 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 who I think he was a captain or, or maybe even bigger than that. And so then him and I started going to uh, Brooklyn like four days a week. And I met one of some guy who was actually not even Italian. His name was Murray, who's passed away now too. He was a Jewish guy. But Murray acted like he was Italian. Uh, he dressed just like an Italian. You know, you wouldn't know he was Jewish, you know, even if you talked to him because he was just that kind of guy. Well, we went around, started collecting money with him. But I think he was, they were close. They had some connections. They had a lot of good guys around them, but they, I started working for them. And they wound up later on chasing Bobby away and they kept me. Well, you get out of prison, but you're still working with the FBI? I, I first, I, I, I hung out with them still. I, I didn't really give them that much information when I first came home. I didn't really want to be bothered anymore. But I, then I was with Bobby and I guess maybe I, things weren't going like maybe the way I wanted to out there in the world. And I still was frustrated with the fact that I couldn't find out who killed my father, you know? I never met Anthony Spiro. I never met really that many, too many. Well, I met a few wise guys down there. I couldn't even remember their names now. And one thing I liked about Brooklyn, these dudes were so out in the open. They come with a trunk, a full load of sweatsuits. What do you, size of you, me, large, boop, big, you know, $100, big, you know. It was just like, it was like business as usual, no problem. So we used to go at the Big Apple Car Company, which was good. I met Anthony Spiro's daughter. I met a lot of these nice, you know, some people. But then I said, all right, I'll start cooperating. Well, yeah, you said that in general, the feds didn't really give you a lot of money. They'd reimburse you here and there. That's all but, they did. But later on, you found out that you were allowed up to 100000 a year being an informant. When I took my second pinch and my lawyer got all the information, they were I was allowed $100,000 a year. And they never gave me none of that. Never offered it to me. And I, and I didn't ask for it, which I didn't know. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> like I said, I ate the sharpest stack in a book. But, I mean, if you were to think about it, I would have had a... A million eight if they would have gave me all that money. Right, if you okay? had it all together. Right. <clears throat> exactly, yeah. if you had it all together. And whatever else I was doing, because they I, they still kept my loan sharking. They didn't care that I was loan sharking. They didn't care I was doing other things like this. I was making about almost $80,000 a year on my own a year. So with that, I'd have been retired by now. <laughs> okay, and the feds actually gave you permission to kill a mafia guy if you had to. They did. And they actually laid out these rules for you? It wasn't that they gave you the rules, Vlad. It's it's kind of like it's <clears throat> look. If I gave you a look or 
a gesture, you'd be like, oh, no, I know what you meant. You know what I mean. I mean, okay. we're, 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 we're regular guys. Well, it's even more different when you're talking as a regular street guy like I was and around mafia guys. You know, that was, I, I just mentioned to Dominic once we were in this place and I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing in there because he was there on business and I was enjoying myself and he just gave me the look and I knew exactly what he meant and I stopped it immediately and that was it. Well, same thing with the FBI as, as, as opposed to, <laughs> listen, to me personally, the FBI is no different than the wise guys. I actually think they're a lot worse because they go under the guise of they're doing something right. Uh, but anyways, I told him about, I was proposed to have the hit on Mikey Mancuso, who's now the boss of the banana crime family. Now, Michael Mancuso, when I go way back, Michael probably doesn't even remember, but his niece used to go out with a friend of mine. Well, sometimes my friend was having a problem with this girl and her mom, who was, it was Mikey, uh, you know, it was Mikey knows his sister said, I'll bring my brother here. And at that time, that was he was with around the Purple Gang back then. I said, I don't give a shit who your brother is. You know, back then I was young, wild, and I, I didn't care. Well, that's how far me and Mike go back. But we never happened to bump heads, which was, I guess, maybe a good thing. Well, anyways, uh, I get proposed to do this thing with, you know, to do I want this life? And now we talked about getting rid of Mike. So now here it is. I'm going to do my first piece of work. So... I did bring it to the FBI. I said, listen, is there any way we can get rid of this guy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever, because, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to shoot anybody. But <laughs> listen, when you're when you're going to be that close to it, you got no choice, Vlad. So he, they said, listen, Joe, you do what you have to do in the street. The first thing they always told me was, first thing is never tell anybody you'll cooperate, which I did lie about. I, I did tell somebody. I told one of my friends that, my friend Pete, because I figured. He was a mafia guy? No. Oh. He wasn't a mafia guy. That's the reason why I told. Uh -huh. Because I figured at least anything happened to me in the street, maybe he could say, hey, you know, uh, he was really working for the feds. Why did you guys protect him or whatever? But he screwed me in the end anyways. But anyway, needless to say, he says, you do what you have to do, Joe, because if I don't pull the trigger, Vlad, I get shot. Yeah. So I said, okay. They said, but then you got to tell us right away when it happens so that this way we can protect you. <laughs> or put you in prison. One of the two. <laughs> exactly. Exa exactly. Now, you and I both know they're not protecting me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it, 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 it's, look, I'm not, I don't want to kill anybody. I'm not going to lie to you. But at the same time, if I was going to do this piece of work, in a way, it was part of what I knew and part of my role I was playing. I, I, I would have I had to do it. And that's it. And so, uh, would I have liked it? No, that's something different. But I was going to get in just as much trouble as anybody else. So I was telling on myself in that respect. Yeah. Okay, so you're out of prison and you start to hang out with Dominic Sakali. Yes. Who I interviewed not too long ago. Yes. Dominic had no idea that you were working with the feds. No. And uh, Dominic formed a really, and I formed a really strong bond. Well, you said that if he actually knew that you were informant, he would have killed you. In a second. He would have killed me. But, but that's who he was. See, you got to remember one thing. You, you've met Dominic now. But I know Dominic before and now. And Dominic is... One thing that Dominic might never want to say, Dominic really did have a big heart. Okay? I seen him do things that was, you know, uh, with his family. He was had a loving heart. And he was always kind of looking for that kind of... And he got that love to his family. Okay? to his daughter and stuff like that, okay? But uh, he also was very true to that life. And he was not gonna hesitate to kill me. And I think he even said he would have felt bad. I think he really would have felt bad because we were that close. Uh, and I would have did anything for Dominic, to be honest with you. Well, you said that if he actually tried to kill you over the whole informant thing, you wouldn't have tried to defend yourself. No. Because you would have respected his decision to do that, which is kind of crazy also. Well, in my martial arts system, I was it was what I was it was called a bushido. A bushido is, is it's a code. It's like a you it's a it's you have the honor of a samurai, but you're not a samurai. But in a samurai system, you have your best friend as the guy to cut your head off after you do to perform the serpico. And so, Dominic, I loved him that much that I don't think I would have wanted anybody else to do it but him. Well, you did actually give the feds information on Dominic. Very little, yes. Yeah. Well, you said that he was a soldier and that he, he got bumped up to captain. Yes. 
but you never really implicated him into anything really serious. No. Uh, although they did ask about the Frank Santoro murder. Yes, but that was all over the Bronx. Okay. Everybody, everybody more or less knew it. Uh, uh, Patty Felsetti was married to a girl, Janet, or Janice, uh, who actually her father was another heroin dealer back in those days too. She was married to Patty Boy, who was actually, I think, a, a, an underboss now in the Genovese family. And uh, she went around telling people and everybody was talking about it. It wasn't like it was a big secret. So I didn't really actually, I mean, there was, I wasn't the only guy cooperating with the government. So you know what I mean. Uh, but I did my part, so to speak. Well, you said that you did jobs with Dominic that you never told the feds about. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about any of those jobs now? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there was a time when I went to go see, we were going to go grab this kid, Hippie, who went around saying that he did stuff to Dominic with a baseball bat and and with all this crazy nonsense he was talking about. I'm going to kill Dominic when he gets back into the Bronx and all of this stuff. And so Dominic, myself, and two other guys went to the place where he hung out and Hippie was not going to make it that night. Uh, nothing happened. We were all strapped up. I don't even know. I might have had my bulletproof vest on at that time. But... Uh, yeah, I didn't tell him because, well, you know why I didn't tell him really? Because nothing really happened. I mean, <laughs> a hippie's very lucky that day, hmm. you know? Uh, there was another time where uh, me and another wise guy and Dominic went to go set a guy on fire because he smacked Dominic's father. And uh, thank God that guy never showed up home, but we waited for about four hours there and he never showed up. I didn't mention anything because, well... Nothing happened. Well, around that time, when you look at the history of the mafia, mm -hmm. there were lots of made members that cooperated, associates that cooperated. True. But mafia bosses did not cooperate. But all that changed mm -hmm. with Joe Messina. That's right. Who was the head of the Bonanno crime family. Who hated my, who hated rats more than anybody? He said he hated the Bonanno family for what that Joe Pistone thing did. He wanted to change the name from the Bonanno family to the Messino family. Ha. Okay. okay. And I was with this guy Jerry Chili. He's passed away now too. He's a captain, and we we got really close at MDC. And he said too, I never liked him. Now, once again, they always usually say that after the fact that he found it's no good. But he probably was true. I would believe him because I liked him. Matter of fact, when I got sent to the box, they came to get me. He's actually reached out to his wife and reached out to then my, my, my fiance at that time to call up. And that's how they knew I was in there. And my lawyer got alerted. Everybody knew. See, that's the way we stuck together. Very good like that. Well, Joe Messino lost a trial. He did. And was facing... The death penalty, I the think. The death penalty. Yes. And then he came in with a get out of jail free card. He said, well, you know, uh, if you you know, overturn my bid, I know information about a hit on, it was uh, the, the prosecutor? Yes. Right. And and the, and the and it was the assistant U.S. attorney, Greg, on, uh, Greg Andreas, right. and also a hit on Judge Garifus. Now, Dominic talked to me when I interviewed him mm -hmm. about this. He thinks that Joe Messino set all this up from the get-go. He knew he was going to lose trial and he needed something to basically get him out of this serious situation. So the whole thing about the hit was set up in order for him to snitch on the person who's setting it up. That was Joe Messino's in to become a cooperator. He made up the story that Vinny wanted to kill the prosecutor. So they accepted him to come in to wear a wire. Huh. Because without that... Like Andres told him, you can't give me anything. So I know he everything. planned this whole thing before he even went in. Before he was found guilty. Before he was found guilty. He knew that he was probably going to be found guilty and he would get life. And this would be so his. So he set up a situation that he started himself to make it look like there was a hit out on the federal prosecutor, which would set off red flags everywhere. Correct. Is that accurate? It could be. Dominic, remember one thing? Dominic was a higher level than me. So Dominic was privy to more uh, information than I was. So I couldn't say that he was wrong. Um, the only reason why I had gotten wind of it, and then I alerted the FBI to it when I had gotten wind to it. 
I'm actually the one who actually stopped it, if it was really going to happen. Right, because Dominic was involved in that hit that was supposed to happen. Dom, I don't believe Dominic oh, was. No, no I, I don't know if Dominic was really involved. He might have been setting up, but I don't know if Dominic was away then or not. I'm not sure, so okay. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But yeah. do, but if the hit was real, and then Dominic would be in on it. Right. And ultimately, that allowed Joe Messino to avoid the death penalty mm -hmm. and essentially be put in witness protection at one point, and then he died some years later, right? Yeah, what a loss. When you found out that Joe Messino, a mafia boss from one of the five families, cooperated, mm -hmm. how did you feel? Consider that you're cooperating yourself as well. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it kind of it lessens the blow on what I'm doing. You know, listen, I've seen a lot of guys that were killers in the street, pure killers, that when you they'd walk into a bar, the bar would actually stop, people would start leaving. <laughs> That's how they were, because they didn't want to be around. Yeah. And yet you put them in the box and they start pressing the button, I want to speak to the prosecutor or the assistant U.S. attorney, okay? Yeah. So I seen guys that were real tough. And then I seen guys you would never think and they wouldn't say nothing, you couldn't beat it out of them. And Dominic was one of my guys that I know for a fact wouldn't have said anything until they betrayed him. I, I know it because I, and I'm willing to put my life on that, okay? Because I know him in the street. I know him now, okay? But there was this loyalty thing. When you get a guy like Joe Messino, he had like, I forget how much money he had. They found him with $10 million in gold or and then money, he owned five houses. You know, he was wealthy, yeah. His wife got to keep all his houses. Crazy. Uh, him and his mother, her, her, his mother or something like that too. Really? Hmm. You know, this is how you reward people after they're doing what they're doing, but you hate them first, you hate them, and now you reward them. I, I don't get it. Well, it did kind of make me feel like, wow, you know, what is this life now? You, look, so I would have died for my mother and father. And so you couldn't have got anything. Because, you know, to me, I actually, at one time when I was a kid, said I'd rather die before my mother and father because at least I knew they'd be there for me. And that's kind of selfish in its own way, but because that's not the way the general order goes. Well, they had Dominic and Vinny were so close the both of them guys, you couldn't separate them. Matter of fact, Vinny, you know, Dominic learned things from Vinny. I started learning things from Dominic. It was really like a, a tight knit crew, you know what I mean? And Vinny actually talked to me while we were in the hall together. Both of us were in the law library. When I mean law library, we weren't, couldn't, there was like all this glass and bullshit. I asked Vinny, I said, why did you talk to Joe? Why, what happened? Why, why'd you say anything? And he said to me, more or less, he said, I, he's the boss, Joe. What am I supposed to do? I think he was trying to justify it, what he did. Because Vinny, listen, there's, I don't want to talk bad about Vinny because Vinny is not a, you know, he does the right thing in that kind of way. But a lot of these rules like guys like Joe, do you think they really want to give up their lifestyle? It's nice to be the top and stuff like that. And that's why a lot of times I think, as a matter of fact, they say in politics the same thing. You run a few years and then get out. He should have been the boss, Joe Messino, for a few years. You had $10 million. How old are you? You need more money than that? I mean, I'm not counting your money, Vlad. I know you're not counting mine, but really? At my age, if I had $10 million, I'm 63 years old. I'm going to die with a few million. Right? Come on. Well, yeah. I mean, I've always considered this whole snitching code is really just a way to protect the guys at the top mm -hmm. and use the guys at the bottom as crash dummies. Right? That's a, but we always That's protect how I look at it because when you go to like white collar crimes, everyone's cooperating and it's just established that everyone's going to snitch, no one's going to hold their mouth. And but in the mafia, it's like, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. But then you have the mafia guys, the mafia bosses like Joe cooperating and setting people up for murders and everything else like that. Could you imagine a boss of a family doing that to somebody like Vinny and anybody else? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, that, that this, this is the whole thing, this is the reason why. Look, when you're a, an associate like me, you get pinched, you don't cooperate. Now you get, maybe you can come home, you get bumped up to a soldier, like John Gotti did when he did a piece of work and they said, okay, now you're this and that, you know? Or like anybody else for that matter. And there are some guys that do it because you're trying to get your way up to the top. You got a, you got a life. You, this is what you're looking for. This is what you want. But those guys at the top, they're tired. Although you got a guy like Fat Tony Salerno, got a hundred years, took it on the chin like it was nothing. You know, so... You know, some guys, uh, you know, look, you're, he's pr pretty much was on his deathbed anyways. So what do you got to lose? Are you going to leave a legacy of not snitching or are you going to 
now you're going to ride everybody out and live like a year, like Joe, like how long did Joe live? And he ride on everybody and now his name is ruined. Yeah. Okay. Well, by 2009, you catch another case. True. For home invasion and murder for hire. Yep. So what was that about? That was just another, uh, that was a bullshit thing. In my lifestyle, I used to talk to everybody. I was allowed to talk about any crime I wanted to. Anything. It was all documented. Matter of fact, I understand my uh, handler, Vinny Pizzuti, said I would have wrote, he could have talked about this. He could have said this. He could have did anything. Could have talked about drugs, murder, this, anything. He says, I would have wrote more if I had room on the paper. Hmm. Okay. It's in the transcripts. But the whole thing is, is uh, I was just talking to this guy. Some, a friend of mine came. He was just posturing for me. He knew it was, you know, knew it was a gangster or whatever. He thought it was or whatever. And he, he wanted one guy to get killed. It was a million dollar life insurance policy. I said, I'll take a look at it. Give me the address. And I did, of course. I sent Mike up there, gave him $1,000. I figured this guy, Mike, earns a payday. Makes me look like I'm still a gangster. He tells all his friends, you know what I mean? It makes it look good. I got some street cred still. Everything's going well. Comes with me with a video. Shows me the video. We can't do it, Joe. It's just too tough. I said, okay, no problem. And it's dead. Well, he gets a pinch. Now he gives me up, mm. says, I know a guy wants to go, I'll go, and he wore a wire. And I pretended like it was still going to go. I knew he wasn't going to do nothing, and I know he wasn't going to have no, nobody killed. That's not who I am. Well, now all of a sudden the FBI come and get me. And what they did was uh, they kept all this pressure on me because they wanted me to work with them. They were uh, what they call C5 squad, which was against the Genovese family. And uh, they wanted me to infiltrate that family now, but they did it where they have pressure on me. You got to do this because otherwise you know, you're going to go to jail for X amount of years and this and this and that. Uh, but they, they, they were the worst people to ever work with. My friend that I called from prison knew I, the phone was being taped. They let me out for two weeks with a piece of paper saying there was just, I was just arrested as an investigation. They did everything like you would, like amateurs. So I said, I don't talk to nobody on the phone. I'm going to call this guy up from prison here. Come on, what's wrong with you? Well, you got to prove yourself. I said, I saved the life of the federal judge and Greg Andreas. That's not good enough. And you know what this guy, Mike Gator, never forget him. Just went like this to me. He didn't care. Okay. He didn't even care about saving his own. This is how dirty the FBI are. It, th their whole slogan is, we don't care what goes down as long as the end justifies the means. They're actually, in my opinion, worse than the F worse than the gangsters. Because the gangsters, you know what you got to do and what not to do and everything like that. These guys here, they make it, they make it up as they go along. Well, you ended up getting nineteen months. I did nineteen months because I fought the case. I did fifteen months in the box where I wound up getting PTSD. Okay, and I still get nightmares when I hear keys and boxes and all of this kind of stuff like that. And the other months I did in on public where I actually had Joe Waverly. Another wise guy with two guys over there goes, that the kid? Because <laughs> they put my fa paper face in the newspaper. And of course, you get the the paper in the prison. And I was on the phone. I said, hey, Joe, how are you? <laughs> I mean, what was I supposed to do? You know? Well, up to this point, you never wore a wire. No. But during your second bid, you actually did wear a wire. I wore a wire once on my co-defendant. Because when I decided, I, I did that purposely. Because I knew that once I talked to him on the wire, and as which is uh, the guy who I, his was attorney was that guy that played in the Goodfellows. He was the the prosecutor against Henry Hill. He was actually my friend's hmm. attorney. Okay. Uh, Ed McDonald was his name. Okay. Well, I did wear a wire, and the wire proved all along what I was saying at trial, and that's why I, I and that's why I like jury trials because if you talk to the jury and you tell the truth, they will see it. Well, right. The trial ended in a hung jury. The only reason why it wound up in a hung jury is because of the conspiracy law. And I don't know how much you know about law, Vlad, but the conspiracy law is really actually illegal. I'm, can I, I can't know what you're thinking right now. Do you know what I'm thinking right now? Okay, I see what you're saying. That's exactly what it is. But I actually faced the jury. Like I'm facing you now, I turned my chair from facing the people in the, you know, out there and looking at the thing. I faced the jury because I want them to look in my eyes because I just told the truth. And my attorney said the same thing. He says... He didn't prep me. He didn't say, Joe, what are you going to do if they say this? He said, Joe, go up there and talk to them like you're talking to somebody in your living room. And I did. And I was open, told them what I had to tell them, and they, I knew that they weren't going to find me guilty. Right, because 
they try to do the trial again, but then it got tossed out. Yeah, because the judge, uh, Judge Buckwald said, you couldn't find him guilty on the murder trials. Now all of a sudden you're going to try to find him guilty on conspiracy, really? Yeah. It was a joke. Okay. Well, at one point you stopped working with the FBI. Long time ago. Yeah. And they retaliated by actually putting your name out in the newspaper? Okay. Uh, the first time I stopped working for the FBI was when they told me they couldn't protect me any longer. They said they couldn't protect my identity from any FBI agents and stuff like that. And so be, because I still wanted to find out about my father, that was in the that was when I after I first came home. The second time was after uh, when when I got took the second pinch, they wanted me to work with them. You know what they told me? Joe, listen, we're gonna put give you some money to put out in the street. I said, Ooh, oh wow, okay, that's great. <laughs> You know, and I says, okay, what do I do when they don't want to pay? How do you want me to collect it? And they didn't want to answer me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I says, okay, don't give me the money to put out in the street. I'm not working with you no more. And then I hired this uh, wise guy attorney, George Santangelo, who actually robbed me about 45000 But he gave me 2500 back. Anyway, uh, he tells Patty Boy Felsetti, and now my word is out in the street. Plus, they outed me that I was a rat all those years. Okay, so the FBI actually not only threw me to the the wolves, he they threw me to the whole jungle, and so now I had no choice but to take a public authority case because now my name is ruined. So now everybody knows it. Now, then they had the balls or the nerve to even ask me three times, "We're going to give you the witness protection program." Hmm. Now, would you take the antidote from the same people who gave you the poison? I don't think so. Okay, I don't think so. And this is how this is how screwed up they are. Well, what was the effect when your name comes out as an informant for was it 18 years? Yep. Because you're still in somewhat of a connection with all these guys that you've mm -hmm. been informing against essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you feel like your life was in danger? Of course. It, I, I'm never going to never be able to think that Okay, it's over. Okay, this is what I'm trying to say. I tried to sue them for $20 million. Right. And of course, they summary judgment, they threw my lawsuit out. You know, it wasn't going to go. You know why they threw it out, really? To be honest with you, they knew that I would win in trial. You know why? Because I beat a fake murder case that they... Hmm. That, so they knew if I just told the truth and told them about all my misery and what I did for the last 18 years and why I got white hair and why I lost it and why I got stressed and why I can't sleep at night... And why I got PTSD was because of them. Yeah, I think the jury would say like, damn, the guy deserves something. Well, was there any attempts on your life after it was found out that you were cooperating? There was people that somebody said there was a $100,000 hit on my life. I don't know if that's true or not. I can't confirm it. Uh, I'm sure if somebody saw me, you know, I'm sure they would probably try to do something if they could. I don't right. know if they could shoot me. Maybe they don't carry guns. Maybe they try to fight me or something like that or right. beat me up. Because you moved out of New York once I did. your name got revealed. I did. I haven't lived in New York in 15 years. Okay. Do you ever go back to your old neighborhood? Uh, I went there the other day, uh, you know, because I had to do the show. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know. Were you nervous? A little bit. You know what? To be honest with you, you know why I'm really nervous a little bit? I'm not, what I did was wrong. I'm not going to try to deny it. But the people I hurt, if they want to come after me, if that's the case, I don't know exactly how many people I hurt because I don't really know what the information I gave, who, who, what the FBI actually did with it. But there was some friends of mine out there who don't like me. All right, you don't want to like me for what, but I never hurt you. I never told anything about you. I never said anything about you. And especially if I get into a fight now and say I go to prison now, what do you think is going to happen to me in prison? I'm, it's kind of hard to run away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you'll be in PC. They would throw me back in the box again. Yeah. And I know a guy that was a Hell's Angel guy. He's been on, uh, I, you think you know him. Um, I think he he's a, was a good guy too. Uh, I, actually was, I actually was good friends. I was friends with Sandy Alexander. I don't know if you ever heard him. He was he was pretty big in Hell's Angel stunt man and everything too. And... Um, he said, I'd rather fight 10 guys than go back to the box. And so would I. I mean, yeah. When I interviewed Michael Franzis and I asked him what the hardest thing he went through, he said being in solitary confinement. And I he believe He said him. that humans are just not designed 
to be in that type of environment. They're social creatures. And when you completely take that away, you'll start to develop, you know, mental health issues. And you're essentially talking about the same thing. I was on clonopin. I don't know if you know what that drug is. It's a mind-altering drug that you can't just get off of it right away. I had to be weaned off of it. Hmm. Because the psychiatrist that was able to prescribe it took one look at me and said, you need to be on medication. Oh, <laughs> look at me. Yeah. Okay, when I first came home, one look at me. I was sitting in the dark. Okay? I, I, I Don't get me wrong. I've managed it a little bit better. But... I get startled at everything you don't, you don't know, and I try to hide it because I don't want people to see any weaknesses in me. But the segregation, the, the solitary, and that's why I have to say thank you to Judge Buckwald because she told me when I went to MCC that he's not going back to the box because he's fighting a trial here. So I, I give her all the props for that, okay? And and I was scared. I almost I passed out almost in the, when they told me I was going to go back to the box. I almost passed out again with the mm. anxiety because I didn't want to go back there. Because you don't, you know, I don't know how to describe it to you, but you're alone. And even Vinny, when I was talking to Vinny Gorgeous, when we were in the thing, he says, you know, Joe, be strong. He says, because these walls start closing in on you. And he was right. And, you know, uh, it was rough for me. Because you got to remember one thing, too. What I was working with the fans, I didn't like it. And I still feel it was wrong to even be with them people. But at the same time, I'm innocent. I didn't, I'm not going to kill anybody. All right. Maybe I got close to it that time when Mikey knows, but he got arrested. Thank God for him. But other than that, I kept my distance a lot of times because I knew that the, the wise guys would want me because I was capable and I was that kind of guy. And I portrayed myself to be that guy. You got to remember, whether I was alone or in public, I always had to pretend and portray the man I was trying to be out there. Well, you called Michael Francis the greatest mobster of all time. I don't know if he's the greatest mobster of all time, but I'll tell you right now, he was one of the biggest earners of all time, probably. Oh, yeah. That whole you gas know, scam was... Well, but you see, but this is another guy. Here's Michael Francis. Loyal. Loyal. Okay? To these people. Giving them more money than they ever seen. Okay? And yet they still had to call him down for a sit down and, and give him a hard time. Are you kidding me? Is it, Where's the brotherhood here? Why don't you say like, hey, brother, good. I mean, they... I, there was rumors that somebody said, oh, maybe he was going to take over the family because, you know, money buys you power. You know that. Okay. Some people, I say, Vlad, let me give you a million dollars. You do this. Nah, Joe, I can't do it. How about I give you five? Wait a minute. That's a little bit more money now. You understand? He wasn't doing anything. He was earning. Yeah. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing, being a criminal. Yeah. I mean, I remember a conversation I had with the freeway Ricky Ross, who was one of the biggest drug dealers in the country at one point, mm -hmm. and his own plug you know, switched on him and, and basically gave him life in prison. Mm -hmm. And he said at first he was angry. He couldn't believe that this guy, you know, turned on him and worked with the with the feds. Mm -hmm. But then he realized that crime comes with cooperating. So you can't just sit there and be surprised when it happens because it happens almost all the time. You have to accept it as part of the reality of the life that you chose. And once he realized that, then he taught himself how to read and he figured out a way to get out of his life sentence. Yeah. Ultimately, he did. Yes. But, but yeah, but it's one of those things where people like to call people snitches and rats and so forth when that's really more the norm than the exception. Sometimes it's an easy way out and nobody wants to put in the time, like this gentleman you just mentioned, to do the work and put in the work to get out legally. There's a, been a lot of people who actually got out of work legally because you got to remember one thing. The feds are like accountants with guns. They don't really, they're not smart really that much. They have a, all the all the money they want in the world. You can hire anybody you want, uh, paralegals, lawyers, and this and that. They're not the smartest tax in the book. Hmm. But you know, the whole thing is like this. This, Did you, I don't know, if you, Tom Cruise made a movie. I forget what it was. He was supposed to be a big drug dealer back then. I forget the name of the movie. Um, they had him killed too. No, 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 not the wise guys, not the drug dealers, the government, okay? <laughs> so I don't know if it was a secret, secret CIA thing he used to do or whatever, but he portrayed it perfectly. American made. That's it. American made. Yeah. That's based on a true story. Mm. And let me tell you something. <laughs> we all know there's another guy that was a CIA guy. I forget his name. Something Webb. I think his last name was. He outed. You, you remember the big crack e epidemic back in the 80s? Remember it was like the big thing? Even, exactly. even Richard Pryor got yeah, burnt Gary out. Webb. Gary Webb. Okay, he exposed the CIA for 
allowing the crack epidemic to start. Well, yeah, Freeway Ricky Ross was part of that story. There you go. Okay, yeah, so that, that's actually connected to what I just talked about. Well, Greg Webb, yeah, but, but, you know, but Freeway didn't know that this was happening at the time. Uh, how he could finds you? out after the fact. Uh, yeah. you, you, well, I found out I was allowed a hundred thousand dollars after the fact. Otherwise, I'd have been telling him, "Listen, I'm spending fifty thousand this week right. with my friends. Can you can you give me the money?" <laughs> right. But Greg Webb committed suicide. Shot himself twice in the head. Yeah, twice. how do you shoot yourself twice in the head? Thank uh, you. Yeah, me and Freeway talked about this. Okay, oh, so there you go. Yeah. There you go. So this guy Freeway knows what he's talking about. Right. Well, you first are cooperating to find out if the mafia killed your dad. Yes. But ultimately, you never found that out. No. So you actually regret cooperating in the first place. Yes. I think there might have been a time, after being around the wise guys as I was, and there's only, listen- most of the wise guys are going to tell you, this is the truth, maybe somebody might not tell you, most of them are out for themselves. Now, when I was with around Dominic, Dominic tried to help me out in the street, make money, do this and that. I mean, he was always there for me. And I'm not saying this because, you know, I still talk to him and everything like that. He really did that in the street. I don't have to lie about here. I don't have to lie about it in my courtroom when I did it. I don't have to lie on my podcast. I don't have to lie on the Goodfellow podcast that I'm involved with, okay? He actually helped me, but that's very f rare in between. Most of these guys get jealous of you making an extra few dollars than them, or if the boss took a liking to you, or you know, if you got invited someplace and they didn't. We're all human beings. These people get jealous, and when they get jealous, mm. they mess with you. They might say, I don't know, why, why is he doing this, or why is he doing that? Look, you can't walk up to it. You, you're smart. Obviously, you got a great show. You're doing great for yourself. Okay, so now imagine me coming up to you and telling you, I got another show. You're going to be like, why are you bringing it to me? I'm doing okay. Why do you want to help me with this great thing that I'm doing? Well, the wise guys say the same thing. You can't just walk up to them and say, I got a good deal. They'll listen to it for a few minutes. But, you know, you need to know what's what here. You know, these guys are sharp. Some of them, anyways. All right. And you just mentioned your podcast. Uh, That's right. Tell us about it. Oh, yeah. The Goodfellow Podcast. Yeah, I just started it now. It's it's uh, it's in its first legs. I'm still getting it going. And uh, I've been telling a lot of stories about my childhood, my family, some friends I grew up with and stuff like that. And it's growing. But I appreciate you uh, allowing me to mention that. Absolutely. Well, uh, Joe Barone, I appreciate you coming in. Um, Thank you, Vlad. You know, people are, are going to make judgments of you. That's and especially right. on the internet, everyone <laughs> likes to feel like they're super gangsters. And if they were put in that position, they would have done 100 years and not told. But that's not the reality no. of life. No. Uh, I've interviewed dozens and dozens of people who have cooperated. And everyone's had their own reason for doing it. Some reasons people agree with, some people don't agree with the reasons, but ultimately it's your life, it's your future, and you have to decide whether you want to stay in a jail cell for decades or if you want to cooperate. And whatever that decision is, I respect it. So thank you, Vlad. Ultimately, you know, I'm not going to be the one judging you. Thank you. You know, you have, you know, you've made your own decision and you're out, and a lot of people are still in prison right now holding on to a set of ideals that the people they're protecting probably wouldn't have done the same in return. Listen, sometimes some people have an opportunity to cooperate and some people don't either. Yeah. Um, I was just in a certain position at my lifestyle that I was. Like I said before, do I think it was right or wrong? Of course not. I don't think it was right. It's a decision I made at that time. Uh, and I have to live with it now. That's the problem. I have All to right. live with it for the rest of my life. Because if you could turn back time- Know what I know now? Yeah. Of course. You would have done it because you would have done roughly the same amount of time without cooperating. I just and would have been in jail a lot longer. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot any, longer or a few years longer? Well, it might have been a long time because if I would have been on a Mikey Knows Mancuso hit and they, and they would have found out that I was the guy that pulled the trigger too, I might have been doing life too. I don't know. Yeah. But also remember one thing too. If anybody tells you I don't care about how many years I do in prison, that's not true. Yeah. They all, we, Everybody cares. Nobody wants to go away. Of course not. But- you know, there are some people that have done, I've seen people done, done 25 years and they didn't bat an eye, you know, so. Yeah. You know, I'm, all I'm depends. sure it's on the inside, they were crying. Of course. They, <laughs> Every yeah, night. <laughs> you know, I, that's, it, when I was in Otisville, there was a guy, Funzi, in there and he was pretty good and he says, you know, you're always happy. He said, but you, you, it's killing you inside. I went, what am I going to do, Funzi? I'm here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. He, so you were right about that. Well, Joe Barone, I appreciate you, you coming in. Wish you all the best. Well, yep, and it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for Take having care. me. Take care. You too. Peace.